Hello and welcome back to Revender and Sports and another edition of Bike Profiles. I personally own and ride a minimum. Actually, let me show something to you. You see this constant flow of cars right in front of my store. You know, <laughs> this is why I think a radar system is completely unnecessary. Uh, I mean, you have to always assume there's a car behind you. All right, so let's get back to the topic of today. Anyway, <laughs> so that's the noise that's gonna be in the background. I apologize, but that's just the nature of living in this seventh largest city in the United States. Okay, I've been doing both bike profiles on at least, uh, I think I've done three. I'll link them all in the description below. And this is one of my absolute favorite bikes. I've had this bike since 1997. Quick math, that's 25, 27 years. Uh, let's see, no, 97. So, I'm so sorry, 25 years. Now, uh, this bike and the um, designer, builder, manufacturer, uh, this is, in my opinion, one of the most important frame builders of the 80s and 90s. And that deserves a video in itself because uh, a lot of the things that he did and a lot of the bikes that were ridden during that time frame, um, you know, 7-Eleven team and uh, Coors Light and all that stuff. So a lot of history with this brand. And Ben Surratt is the gentleman I'm talking about. His namesake is on this uh, down tube. So let's get into this bike. I've had this bike I'm original owner. It's funny because I had this discussion with my girlfriend last Friday when we were talking about one of my other bikes and she says, oh, you original owner? Yes, all my bikes, I am the original owner. I built them from the frame up, every bike. And that was very common in the old days, right? You bought a frame, you built it up. You wanted wheels you built up wheels. You bought your hub, you bought your spokes, you bought your rim, and everything was custom made to you. Geometry was custom all the time, and steel made that possible, whereas now carbon is, it's in a mold, and you get what you get unless you go with a carbon frame manufacturer, and well, that's a pain, and usually pretty expensive. Okay, so let's get into this bike. This is the CSI model, which for many, many, many years was their top of the line steel bike. And if you believe the marketing materials in their catalogs of the time, any other model that was made that year or in those years, they always wanted to replicate the ride of this bike had to be at least this good if it was going to be an inline product. So at the time of this bike in 97, uh, they were also doing very well with titanium manufacturing. And so they wanted the titanium frames to have this same similar geometry and have a uh, performance characteristics that were at least as good as this steel bike. So this bike is currently built with Ultegra and uh, Ultegra 11 speed and the eagle eye amongst you will notice that the crank set is a 10 speed 7900 Durace crank set but you know 10 speed 11 speed chain rings and chain they work well together and you know I've I've got <laughs> I've got the Ultegra chain the Ultegra crank set with 50 34 chain rings on my Richie Swiss Cross, which is another video I still need to do. This bike, since I've had it, and as I mentioned, 97, it has had multiple, multiple group sets on it. So it started its life as a nine speed Durace equipped bike, nine speed. 
then it went to 10 speed durace and then it had electronic durace and what would typically happen is during the race season i would have a sponsored carbon fiber bike uh, could have been Cannondale, Cervelo, uh, Felt, any of those carbon manufacturers. I would get a bike for the racing season, either on loan or, you know, uh, a re very reduced price at the end of the year to purchase it. Or maybe I would be able to purchase it at a ridiculously low price. And when that year was over, I would give back that carbon fiber frame and get back on this bike. And this bike was always my winter training bike. And I always thought it was kind of silly that I would ride a steel bike during winter months when, you know, corrosion could be an issue with steel bikes. But I always sprayed frame saver in it uh, before I would ride during the winter months again. If you do not know what frame saver is, it comes in an aerosol can. Once you remove all of the components, so you have your bottom bracket opening you have your seat tube opening and your frame, I'm sorry, your head tube and down tube and top tube uh, junction open. You just spray the frame saver all through there, turn the bike upside down, right side up, and just keep doing that so that the frame saver can coat every everything on the inside of your steel bike. I would do that on a yearly basis. It's Southern California, so it doesn't rain much here anyway, but I would do that just because the bike was already all apart. So nine speed Durace, 10 speed mechanical Durace, then 10 speed 7970, which I took off of one of the sponsored bikes, put on this bike. Then eventually it went to Durace 11 speed, and now it's Ultegra 11 speed. The Durace group moved on to another bike. Wheels, a plethora, plethora of wheels throughout the years tons of different wheel options here and um, so this is its current iteration but there are a few things that have been on here since day one and I'm gonna go through those things with you so let's start from the very front of the bike so this is one of my absolute favorite handlebars and I tell people when you find a product that really really works for you you should buy two of them. <laughs> and that is definitely true of saddles. By the time you find a saddle that works for you, please buy two of them. Because by the time you need another saddle five years down the road, that saddle's been discontinued. This handlebar is a Reynolds handlebar. And it has a very, very slight sweep forward. So when you're in your climbing position, which I climb right here next to the stem, this is where I spend most of my time even on the flats. So this part of the bar has kind of a shape like this, and then it's not flat, but it's fairly, um, it, the, the roundness does not continue all the way around the bar. So this bar sweeps forward a little bit. It's got a nice handhold here. So. You can have this position close to you when you're sitting straight up and you're climbing. You can now sit, sit up straighter. You can now um, you know, assist or facilitate your, lung, your lungs fully expanding, opening and closing, opening and closing. And you have the, the option then that if you want to get long and low, this sweeps forward and now you can go towards your drops or your tops i'm sorry from your tops to your brake hoods or your drops now the other thing that i have here is this stem now i i do need to go back because i didn't talk about this this during this time frame in 1997 um, all of these bikes were custom made they had some off the shelf geometries but if you got a serrata you got a custom frame. That's just what you did. So this bike was made for, you know, uh, the 41 year old man. <laughs> I'm now, uh, well, let's see, it was uh, 19, 
um, I don't know, count back 25 years. So yeah, I was in my late thirties, you know, and that's a different person than the person riding this today. Uh, so the head tube was made for uh, someone that's 25 years younger. And, uh, you know, so in that time frame, this bike was the type of bike that was of race geometry. I was much, much younger, 25 years old, but I can still ride this bike. And this is, this is uh, an important time to talk about stuff, about this. Your, your bike fit is ever evolving. There's many reasons why it will change. It could be injuries, it could be medical reasons. You, you may have had a crash and then your, your discs are fused, uh, your vertebrae, vertebrae are fused and now you can no longer bend like you used to. But this bike still fits me very well. Um, I will be riding it this weekend and uh, Saturday is probably another six or eight hour endurance ride. Okay, so I said all of that because this is a level stem and um, yeah, it's, it's very hard to get folks to ride these kinds of stems these days. Everyone wants a, a very elevated stem. They want a large uh, stack height here between the headset and the bottom of the stem. And then you've got all these endurance bikes with these really tall head tubes, which I feel like I'm driving a bus. Well, so let's go back to this. So this Chris King headset has been on this bike since inception. And I actually crashed this bike many years ago. And when I crashed it, the fork that was on here, which was a Serrata fork, all of this here, it, it, it came in so much so that there was a rubber uh, burn mark here. So imagine how much that fork went in. And so there was a, a, a rubber uh, residue here on the bottom of, of this down tube. And the frame buckled right here behind this lug and this lug underneath here. And so um, the frame sat for many years until I ended up in the bike industry in 2004. And I said, hey, you know, uh, a shop down the road, I said, hey, you guys are a Serata dealer. Can I process this for uh, some repair? And they said, sure, you know, you're in the bike industry, you're up the road from us. So they sent this frame back to Serata. And <laughs> when I got it back, I thought the frame was new. Like I thought they were just going to replace this top tube and this down tube, which of course you, you heat up this lug area and you can pull this stuff out. But in fact, they redid it. They had my geometry. They asked me how much uh, I was willing to spend. I said, look, I love this bike. It's, it's one of my absolute favorite bikes. And they said, okay, well, it'll be this much and you know, we'll paint it and we'll do everything else. So I got, they still had my geometry data. They, they rebuilt the bike. And um, I mean, it's, it was new when it came back to me, which is amazing that they would do that. Um, of course, I was in the bike industry, so maybe that's a thing. Let's talk about the color real quick, because this color was from the titanium options. Now, it was custom, you could do whatever you wanted to, but I didn't like any of the color schemes. And oh, by the way, <laughs> Had I chosen one of those color schemes, this bike would look completely dated today because it is from 97 and the colors were, in my opinion, even at that time, were absolutely horrendous. And they were very show me, very look at me, look at me. I am a, you know, day glow color. And I, I just didn't like that. So I chose this color scheme from the titanium options. And I actually ran into a guy once who was riding the Thai bike, which is called the Legend. And it was the same color scheme and we were both riding next to each other. And I took pictures of that, but that was on print. I didn't have it, you know, we didn't have cell phones and 
and uh, and I actually took uh, a picture because I always I always went around with a camera and always took stuff pictures of stuff and yeah I, I was able to get a picture of his bike and my bike even though his was titanium and mine was steel but we had the same paint scheme anyway so that's the paint and uh, if we can get out in the light in the sunlight you'll see some sparkles and that's always nice now that headset Chris King headset it's a one inch so this is probably the only downside of this frame is it was built around a one inch head tube one inch steer tube and one inch works extremely well for steel forks but a one inch carbon fork just is not stiff enough so this front end compared to modern steel bikes like let's say my Ritchie Logic on the Ritchie Logic it's a one and an eighth head tube and the fork is one and an eighth steer tube and that bike up out of the saddle you can put all your weight on it there's no issue but on this bike because of the one inch steer tube um, and let's take a look at it from this angle because of the one inch steer tube it's just not that stiff so but you learn to work around it you really do you you don't put as much into the front of the headset um, so the next thing is the the down the tubes now it's very difficult to capture this on on a video but this tube is not round it's ovalized right so it looks kind of like that and not round. And so you have this, this tube is ovalized. Again, the lug, I didn't want one of these show me, or I'm sorry, look at me, look at me lugs, right? So the, the lugs are painted the color of the frame. Now, the next thing that's super important to talk about is their Colorado Concept tubing. What they did is they took tubes that were because they were having a lot of trouble with uh, tube failures from True Temper. And that was a tube that they were using that was basically a sheet and then they would roll it. And uh, generally what you want, and like Columbus tubing on my stainless steel bike, is you want seamless tubing. You want a tube that you've pulled and extruded. Um, that steel is a lot better to work with. So. This tubing was made by Columbus, especially for them. And what you'll notice here is this tube starts at a certain diameter here. And then by the time it gets down to the bottom bracket, this tube is quite large down here. And so that allowed for a lot more, uh, let's see if I can get that to focus in, that allowed for a lot larger bottom bracket area where these two tubes, so the seat tube and the down tube, would come down and be stiffer than, a, than an actual round tube, skinny round tube. And, and you know, the big thing about steel bikes is that they have small tubes. So how do you increase the stiffness? One of the things you do is, you, you, you know, you follow that Cannondale model where you just, in the aluminum side, you make these much bigger tubes but they're thinner right so you can see it much more dramatically on this tube here so you follow this tube this diameter and then as it keeps going down into the bottom bracket area it is pretty massive i'll turn this bike around so we get a better look at it here in just a second but we need to continue on on the drive side the this seat clamp area here, a lot of modern bikes now have seat clamps. This is just not the way uh, steel bikes were made, right? You, you have this, a reinforced area, so you get a good clamping force on the seat post. But let's talk about something that was quite a bit controversial at the time, and now many, many, many bikes do it, and it was the S tubing or the S chain stays. 
Now this bike isn't as dramatic as some of the bikes that followed, but you'll notice that this area here is really tight, which by the way, that then limits your tire choice. This is a 25 tire, and you can see there's very little space there because everything at the time was designed to be, oh, well, we want it to be really tight in the wheel well area. And you can even see a bridge added there for additional stiffness. And they weren't thinking about, well, one bike does it all. You'll just have several bikes. You have a bike for your cyclocross season. You have your bike for this, bike for that. So, and remember that at this time, in the mid 90s, they were racing on probably 19 tires. So this is a 25 tire and I've just got barely enough room. Um, if I were to do some graveling here, I got barely enough room for that. But let's get back to these S days. Now this one is not as much as I, as I said, they eventually got, but what would happen, what they wanted to do was get this really tight, flare this out. And what happened was during the Olympic time frame uh, of 84 and, and subsequent Olympics, uh, Serato was building track frames and they noticed that uh, riders' heels were hitting the chainstays because they were trying to get them to come out and be stiff and all this other stuff. And so they then tapered them in, made the S and came back out. And that alleviated the issues with the heel but as i mentioned now you know it's got very limited amount of uh, tire clearance uh, again with steel bikes you do not have a hanger so this is wonderful a detachable hanger i should say and in its current iteration it has just this ultegra uh, short cage derailleur because the wonderful thing about some of these steel bikes like my Richie and this one, there is no problem with getting a 28 or a 32 cassette back here, even though you've only got a short cage derailleur. I think in the past, I might've put a 34 cassette on here. I can't remember with a short cage derailleur, but uh, that is a beautiful thing. I don't know why it, the hanger hangs, I guess a little bit lower. I'm not a frame designer. That's just not what I do. But what ends up happening is I can put larger cassettes on this with a short cage rear derailleur. Uh, you know, so this bike, I've mentioned before that I won't weigh bikes routinely on this channel. But out of curiosity, I've weighed this bike and it is just, it is just under 19 pounds. And I guess that's about eight and a half kilograms. Now, I mean, let's keep this in mind. This is a this is a bike from 1997, so 25 years ago, and now with all the freaking ridiculous obsession with carbon and disc brakes and electronic this and electronic that, I mean, you're you're struggling to get an entry level bike, maybe even mid tier bike. So five, 6,000, maybe more dollars to spend to get your bike under nine kilograms, under eight kilograms, under seven is, is a real stretch and that's just pro bike. And uh, those guys are riding, you know, tubular wheels and, and tubular tires. Yes, tubeless is becoming more and more prevalent, but not, it's not widespread yet. And some teams are still riding tubular tires and rims and that's how they can get their bikes down to that sub seven kilogram or even the uci weight limit of uh 6.8 kilograms so i just wanted to do this because you know people obsess about grams and uh and it's just it's really really silly so this is a rev cycling bottle you know and you choose your, uh, it, and it's, it has water in it. So 30 ounces or 861 grams or, you know, one pound, 14 ounces. You know, I mean, people obsess about 10 grams, 100 grams here and there. 
and yet a water bottle weighs 860 grams. So people, just stop with the nonsense. Okay, let's talk about the wheels. The wheels came are a takeoff off of another bike. Uh, my girlfriend is riding my Richie Logic while her bike is in the repair stand. So the wheels on that bike, which are the head, Arden, black, would be my preferred wheel on this bike. I prefer alloy wheels. You know, I gotta be honest with you, the carbon wheels are just here for show. They look nice, it, uh, you know, especially with the um, Tour de France special edition uh, GP5000 tires uh, tubed. I just thought it would, it would pop. It would look really nice on the bike, but you know, I'll ride them from time to time, but I really, 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 really prefer aluminum wheels. And um, you know, in a good high-end set of aluminum wheels, weigh just as much as, or, or sometimes lighter, especially if you get something like a, a Rolf Prima wheel. I mean, those wheels are lighter rim brake wheels than carbon wheels. So there's that. And as I mentioned, it's basically an Ultegra group front to back. Uh, again, on all my bikes, I really like my SQ Lab saddles. So there that is. And uh, this is a SQ Lab Ergo Wave, 612 Ergo Wave. You can see the nomenclature there, 612. And this is a bike that, I'm sorry, this is, this is a saddle that I can ride very comfortably for hundreds of miles in a single sitting um, and then come back the next day and ride another couple of hundred miles. And I mentioned that because um, I, I used to do a lot more endurance riding than I'm doing currently. And um, I think it was 2020. Yeah, it was 2020 during the COVID lockdown timeframe. I was, uh, you know, I did two 500 milers that year. One of them, was the Hoodoo 500, it was 186 one day, 170 something the next day, and 150 something the next day. And it was 30,000 feet of climbing throughout. So um, really big days in the saddle. And I was super comfortable on my SQ Lab saddle. Well, that's, I believe, all for today on this particular bike. I am, I cannot wait to see the questions and uh and the response for this because if you know serata you just know this was a monumental uh, brand when it came to steel and titanium and it's a pretty sad story what happened to the owner uh over time and maybe i'll cover that in a different video um so but 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 as a brand and they also had you know fitting machines for uh, bike fitting machines for shops so that you could do a custom build on your bike and um, a custom frame geometry for your bike. Every bike was pretty much custom and this is one of them. So thank you so much for tuning in. Please like and subscribe. If you like bike profile stuff, please let me know. I've got other bikes I still need to do. Uh, they're all operational and um, you know, it's kind of like a little bit of a museum when you walk into my shop because a lot of these bikes um, represent very important time in the uh, history of, of, of frame building. And, and they're still ridden today. I, you know, <laughs> I would venture to say if you've got a 27, 25 or 30 year old carbon bike, which there weren't that many, it would be a it would not be a great bike <laughs> today, but this still is a fantastic bike to ride. Um, still a lot of performance, still a lot of ride comfort. And uh, I would venture to say a carbon bike from this time frame would be a, a pile of bolts. Let's just say that. Okay, thank you so much for tuning in. Please like and subscribe. We'll see you up the road.